But yes, yeah, so I was watching, just for anybody listening, I was listening to Mr. Robert Bubby Lewis this morning um, as I was having my breakfast. Bubby, if you're listening, you were a lovely... So it was so great spending my morning with you. <laughs> my, <laughs> yeah. my, uh, my wife and kids are on holiday at the minute. So, um, oh, and dude, just getting up this morning. Yeah. I was just, I went to bed. I told you what I was going to do last. Yeah. I, I was, we spoke about this, right? I we was did. in bed at nine. So I was like, I said half eight. I was in a bed, bed, in bed at nine, asleep by quarter past. I woke up at like half five. It was oh, awesome. Incredible. Bed, I swear the I swear the bed was comfier than usual. <laughs> <laughs> this is I woke up, I was like, I feel really comfortable. Uh, I walked through into the living area and there was no carnage. It was just oh, it was awesome. Just as you'd left together. It. Yes. Oh, just as I left it, <laughs> open the laptop. I was like, seriously, and I was like, who can I watch this morning? Because I never watch anybody while I'm having breakfast because I've normally sure. got kids around my house. Of ankles, course, you know? yeah. Uh, and I was I was like, I'm going to watch Bubby. So I put like Bubby Lewis on. Oh, that's, oh, that's a Lewis high clinic. honor. Yeah. Oh, dude is frightening. Like yeah. he is bonkers frightening. His technique is otherworldly. Like, well, yes. everything actually is otherworldly. And his shoes is what well. he's got some cool shoes going on. He's got, <laughs> yeah, like he's a, got a cool vibe. Going on. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> he's got a cool vibe going on. But yeah. on top of that, the cherry on top of the cake is that his bass playing is just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Did you watch the interview that Herrera did with him for I, SBL? Yeah. I sure did. And I hadn't I wasn't as hip to him and it made me it made me really want to dig in. Um cool guy and just so like giving and it was awesome, awesome to see that interview. Jonathan's so great too. He's great yeah. at pulling stuff out of he's people. He's a great and interviewer. He really is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's had yeah. he's had you know get Jonathan to develop do. those skills, man. Working at BP, so great. How long was he at Bass Play Magazine for? I, you know, I don't know. I but I, I mean, I remember I would read all his. What do they call it in the beginning? Like a, it's like uh, is it a forward or, notes or whatever? Editor's notes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I would read all those and think like, oh, yeah. this guy is. And little did I know. We'd be we'd be rubbing elbows. I don't know if that's how you say that. Bumping elbows, <laughs> virtually. Bumping elbows through, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But he's a great dude. So if anybody's so fun had, to work with him. If anybody's missed it, yeah. If anybody's missed it, Jonathan Herrera is. Um, he's done a, doing a bunch of stuff for SBL. He he's done obviously he's done a bunch of really fantastic interviews that are inside SBL. He's done one with obviously Robert Bobby Lewis. He's done one with John Patucci. Mm -hmm. He did one with um, Daryl. Um, like he's just you know he's done like a bunch of really fantastic interviews. And but Jonathan actually used to be the editor in chief at Bass Player Magazine. So that's right. When Ian and I were coming up, Jonathan was like super cool. Like oh, he's still super yes. cool. Jonathan, if you're listening, you're still super cool. But when we were like coming up, he was like the editor of the the world's bass magazine, right? Yeah. Like so, Jonathan. Yeah, I can remember seeing Jonathan. I was at an event. And I remember like looking over and I was like, whoa, whoa. that's Jonathan Herrera. Yeah, yeah, he's like got the keys to the kingdom. <laughs> that's right. He would get all the cool basses yeah. and amps to test, you know, and then he would take yeah. them out on gigs and he'd review them. And I'd be like, oh, man, what a life. So awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dude's killing as well. He is a killing player. Yeah. Oh, you know what else? You know, he's so a killing good. player and he's also a killing synth player. Did you know that? He's really into synthesizers. Yeah. He, I, I saw like a, a thing where he was playing synth in a band with some really cool sounds. And I'm like, oh man, who are you? You're, you're a, he's, a, he's full of, uh, he's full of fun surprises. Really cool. We should get him to do do something for SBL on the synth thing, actually. Like, he's done, actually, a compression course, which is... Yep, that's right. Have you seen that? Com Not Have yet. I need course? to. I need to see it. Is it is it oh, live? Is it out? It's really great. Okay, cool. I don't yeah. think it's... I, it might be now. I'm not sure, but it's coming out. But it's, okay. it's really great. It's been filmed really great as well. He's like, Jonathan's there. He's got the whiteboard. He's even got, like, this pointer. It's like... I was Yeah! Like, oh. And it was... <laughs> and I watched it, like, the whole thing, back yeah. to the front. I was Amazing. Like, oh, wow, this is actually... I was learning. Like, it felt like I was at school. I, oh, basically, that's great. Basically, like, Jonathan was my teacher. I was back in school, so... Professor yeah, really Herrera. Fantastic. But I'm not sure. Yeah. I think it will be out now. But, yeah, okay. I think the students are my... The students will know. The students will let us know if it's out. <laughs> yeah, they'll let us killer. know. Yeah. Anyway, 
Dude, what are we talking about today? It's pedal boards, right? It's pedal board day. Do you have to build one, Scott? Do you have to build a pedal board? I love that. You're like, what, what about this? Do you have to build a pedal board? Do you have to build a pedal board? Can I, be, can I have a bit of a confessional? I have Please. only once, only once in my existence as a musician, yes. had a pedal board. Really? Other than that, I was the guy that turned up just with, with a bag full of nuts and bolts. <laughs> and yeah, I just, yeah. <laughs> I just you know just pedals, oh, I love right? it. And I was just I was just I was just always a bit crap at getting that organized right but it just you know and and honestly I've never been a huge effects guy it yes. was always for me it was it was like you know well tuner obviously uh, before the clip on tuners but it was a tuner it was an octave pedal it was like distortion chorus you know, like you know maybe of course, a bit of verb yeah. or you know stuff like that and that was it but sure. and then but it seems to have just exploded since then. So I think there's various things we could get into. Oh, for y sure. Yes, like, do you have to build a pedal board? But also stuff like separate pedals versus yes. multi-effects. Because course. let me just put it out there. Before I met you, before you joyfully swung into my life, <laughs> I, yeah. if anybody had asked me that, right, I don't know why you yeah. would swing. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see oh, you. Oh, oh, oh. Anyway, yeah, yeah, exactly, like Tarzan, yeah. yeah before yeah. I, I kind of sort of like, you know, discovered you online, I was all about the single pedals. Sure. You just came in and and and, and just kind of, and I was like, oh, this dude's all about like you've got a multi effects thing and yeah know, yeah like stomp and yeah and I let let me anyway let me just put it over to you like first of all multi multi effects or single pedals you take it let's just let's go. okay okay well be, okay before I answer that though let me just say I I really want to address the thing about the bag of pedals. Um, I was just, you know, I was just in New York and I got to spend some time with uh, John Davis. And anybody listening, if you don't know John Davis, he is an incredible bass player. Started on Upright, uh, but now plays electric bass and plays in Nerve with Jojo Mayer, a fantastic drummer. And they are a killing kind of like progressive jazz electronic. There's maybe aspects of dubstep. Um, oh, yeah. man. And he was oh, a dude, huge he's influence. Got, he's got a course. <clears throat> Yes, that's right. Come into SPL. That, that's Which right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was asking. He said, "Do you know when this course is coming out?" I said, "I don't know, but maybe I'll, I'll try to find out for you." But he's really excited about it. Yeah. So if anybody wants to know about the synth bass thing on electric bass, he really was a big, big player for me in terms of of validating, like, "Oh, you can do this." But. The reason I bring him up right now about pedal boards is he has this incredible, amazing pedal board that I got to plug into. But in the beginning, he walked into a nerve rehearsal like he got the call he had to sub for it he walked in and jojo mayer brought in a duffel of pedals Poof. and these and they were the nerve <laughs> pedals so you know he had worked with maybe lefebvre or something on you know oh well you have an octave you know maybe there's a whammy that, and there's a few things and he said i don't know like jojo was like these are the things we use and you know maybe plug these in and and try this. And so in the beginning, John Davis, who to me is this, like the purveyor of the finest, you know, synth sounds on electric bass, uh, just was like, yeah. oh, I guess I'll try to plug this in and this <laughs> in. And so, so I don't want to discourage anyone like, oh, well, you have to build a pedal board. It's a process. It starts with, I wonder what this thing does. Right. I mean, you know, and like for you, I love yeah, that yeah. idea of like, instead of like, well, I'm going to build this rig. Well, maybe you have a situation where you have a few things and you find out what you like first. So the bag of pedals, the bag of nuts and bolts, as you call it, is not a bad thing. <laughs> I mean, because everyone starts, um, you know, I, I, spoiler, of course, you don't have to build a pedal board. It's really, do you yeah. want to build a pedal board? <laughs> Right. So to, to come back yeah. to your question around um, uh, multi versus single pedals, whenever someone asks me this in a DM, I always tell them it's about self-awareness. It's how you like your workflow. So I'm I'm weird. I have a I'm not I'm not weird. That's a dumb cop out word. I have a bunch of different things that I do uh, in Minneapolis, like gig wise, that sort of require mm -hmm. or I think require different sounds. So when I work with a particular singer songwriter and I want to do maybe like a baritone bass kind of sound and have spring reverb and tremolo, I have a 
set up for that. And then on a different preset, click, I have a thing that I do with a wedding band that has sounds in it for, you know, can't stop the feeling, and you know, and and specific yeah, yeah, synth yeah. sounds, and that's that one. And then I have a thing that I use, you know, kind of my regular stuff that I use all the time, and I have that set up in a different thing, and maybe that has some overdrive and chorus. But the multi-effects thing that you're asking about, for me, is the HX Stomp, um, and that's made by Line mm -hmm. 6. It's a great little um, computer, essentially, in a box. Uh, and But I got to that as a result of single pedals. I think it's so easy to see yeah. someone's trajectory as like, oh, maybe they've always been multi-effects guy. But for me, when um, Line 6 released, I mean, there were sort of multi-effects things. Remember, Scott, remember the green delay, the DL4 came out in maybe 2000 or something. You remember that Every, big? The Line 6. Er, yeah, 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 Line 6, you know. Everybody they, had it. Everybody yeah. Had it. And they made a bunch of those. So they made a purple one that had all synth sounds. And I was working at a music store, Mars Music in the States, which went belly up years later, but sort of a competitor to Guitar Center. And I remember when those came, I remember the day when those came in on the sales floor and I was like, whoa, there's one that does like synth sounds? Wow. I remember plugging into it, mind blown. So I started... Mm -hmm my multi-effects journey with those pedals in 2000. I mean, that's 21 years ago. I mean, crazy. So yeah, the reason I use the multi-effects thing now is it's just the evolution of that product. So all of the sounds that I fell in love with 21 years ago, they put into M series of pedals. If anyone listening remembers the M13, M9, M5, yeah. I got way yeah. into those and sent it off to JHV3 to get modded with you know, true bypass switches. I mean, I, you know, I went hard into that world. <laughs> and then when that, then when they started to release the Helix stuff, it was like, oh, well, it's all the, it's all of those pedals plus, you know, amp modeling if you want to. And it's smaller and the foot switch functionality is amazing. I had come up organically through the all of those products for the past 20 years to make me feel comfortable about pulling the trigger on that little supercomputer. Um, so that that's sort of a long answer to say, if you don't, like, like if you buy one of those HX stomps and you have no uh, previous experience with the Line 6 ecosystem or with uh, multi-effects in general, it feels so daunting feels like oh what am i how do i even navigate that is exactly around this what thing people said to me yeah. yes in fact yeah. i did a live stream i did a live stream last week was it and on the live stream we were talking about so i do a live stream um for the, the members bass hang every right? single month and we were, yeah the bass hang yeah so yeah. We're on the on with all of the members and and i was asking these guys i was like I, and just for my own kind of um curiosity really i was just like who uses single pedals and who who uses oh, multi effects yeah. and why? Mm. And the majority of people, by far, the majority of people, by far, use single pedals. Yes. And everybody that gave feedback on the actual live class was saying they don't use multi effects. And this was pretty much across the board because of yep. overwhelm of using the product. That's Absolutely. the thing that scared them off. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I totally understand that. And I sometimes take for granted that I've been in that Line 6 ecosystem for 20 years. And I go, oh, yeah. And, I, you know, I'm kind of fine to just scroll around. And I still don't know it as well as some people do. But there, for me, what it is, is it's about the sounds. I fell in love with a few sounds in that, those Line 6 products that I honestly feel like I couldn't live without. I'm, I mean, I'm sure I would get used to some other sounds, but there's a spring and a tremolo that I use all the time and I love them. Uh, 63 spring, if anyone wants to know, an opto tremolo. I mean, it's just the things that I got used to, right? And then some synth sounds too in the purple FM4 that all those sounds are now uploaded into the Helix stuff too. And so for me, it's like, well, uh, I want to figure out how to use this technology because I like the sounds. So it's it's that thing we talked about, Scott, where, you know, when you were trying to figure out how to post to YouTube and you're in the internet cafe, you know, and you're talking about how, like, you know, you're, you're tech averse, right? And and the teacher yeah. way long ago was like, oh, no, you know, divine on the computer again, and, and maybe you've internalized some of that. But because you had a goal in mind of creating this thing, you were fine to step into that technology thing and just 
figure it out. But I don't yeah, think yeah. you have to, uh, you know, everybody is different. Everyone has different sonic goals. And so um, in terms of multi versus single pedals, it's just about workflow. And what I always tell people is if you haven't experienced effects yet, just buy a couple single pedals. And even like the Behringer ones that are 30 to 50 bucks, mm -hmm. like if you don't know yeah. what octave, envelope, chorus, overdrive, fuzz, you could buy all of those pedals for very little money and then kind of see like, oh, wow, I'm finding that I love this octave pedal or like, oh, wow, I don't think I will ever use fuzz, <laughs> you know, and then maybe yeah. you kind of, you start to have some opinions. You start to learn, um, you know, like you, you talked about, Scott, it's like, uh, it's like learning this vocabulary, learning how to craft sound is similar to learning how to use scales, right? So you just have to kind of get in, maybe buy some single pedals. And then when you go, oh, I'm finding that I'm always using these things, wouldn't it be nice to have those consolidated in a small thing and I could have presets for the different artists I work for? That's how it should happen. Mm. Versus I'm going to buy yeah, that yeah, HX yeah. stomp, I'm going to download somebody's presets, and I'm going to be killing it. It's like, well, maybe, but it's then you just feel, I think, maybe more disconnected from that world and that um, workflow. And I think it's about workflow. If you like putting hands on knobs and stuff, just get single pedals. And just to, for anyone listening, I, I have a I've combo of questions. both. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. I've got two questions, man. Yeah. And for anybody listening, there's a slight delay between me and Ian. So we're yeah. going to speak. it was like that the other day as well, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It's my yeah. crappy internet at the minute. But anyway, so I've got two questions. Firstly, that qu they, the the feedback that I got from the guys in SBL, that people yeah. were mainly using single pedals because they felt overwhelmed with yeah. the um, with the multi effects. So my first question is. Is that real, or do they just need to sit sit with it for two to four weeks? So, is it real, or is it just have they just got like some kind of like pre? You know, they've got like this. They, they're stressed before they even open the box. They're like, "Oh, this is going to be overwhelming." You know I mean, like, sure, is it sure. real? And then, secondly, is there a sonic difference between multi effects and single pedals? Oh, is there boy, somebody out right. there's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, no," like I need to use single pedals because they sound better than mm. effects. So, they're my, they're my two questions. That's those are great questions. I mean, the overwhelm is of course real. Like, I, I am not the guy to say like. Um, um, oh, you know, just get over it because I really, this is art, right? We're talking about, we're talking about a language. We're talking about vocabulary. Like we're talking about music as vocabulary. So mm -hmm. it's about how you like to work. And what I think is amazing is when someone finds a unique way to work, that's always the thing that gets people excited about the sounds. Great example, Tom Morello, guitar player for Rage Against the Machine has oh, been so using... Good. Yeah, and he's been using the same pedals since 1990, <laughs> right? And, and he hasn't changed anything. He hasn't gone into the, yeah. you know, into the multi-effects world. And he has been able to innovate on those things. And whenever he feels like, ah, oh, you know, maybe, I, maybe I've kind of done all I can do, he looks at his guitar and picks up, you know, maybe a, an Allen wrench and sees, oh, what if I hit the strings with an Allen wrench? How? So he's really innovative in that, like, use what you have. And that is really um, compelling and interesting to me. And it's interesting to everyone else, too. So people then put that on, people say, oh, I need the whammy pedal because of Morello. And it is, it's a really cool sound, but it's the way he uses it that's interesting, right? It's like the sound was already in his head. He describes that sound as a caged bobcat. And I love that. I, you know, <laughs> like, oh, you know, and it, that sound. And I think like, oh man, that it's already in his head before he's trying to get it, you know? And he might be have, have yeah. been surprised and delighted by pedals and like, oh, wow, well, I can use this in this way. But he has this idea of what he wants to get out and then the pedals are tools, right? So mm -hmm. the overwhelm, um, coming back to overwhelm, it's absolutely real. It's just about how you like to work. And again, for me, the path to multi-effects was really organic. It was like, oh, I would love to have 20 different individual pedals on my board, but actually there's something really great about making a scene for an artist and then just being able to recall it. Click, 
kind of like, you know, back when you had to take down every setting on every piece of gear in a studio to recall a mix. Well, now Pro Tools, you just bring up the file. And that is something that's really great about the multi-effects thing. If you have a bunch of different bands or projects that you play with, and you sort of feel like, oh, it'd be nice to have certain sounds for these things, a multi-effects can help you kind of organize those sounds in that way. But you just have to like it. You have to want to do that. I mean, I'm playing bass on a thing, kick on a, a patch, and think, oh, I wonder if when I get home I should bring this down 0.5 dB. It seems to be a little too much over the top, you know, and that's something that you can then do mm. in a multi-effects. If, if you're that level of nerdy, like I am, where I'm always kind of analyzing, oh, I wonder if the chorus could be a little wider. You know, I'm thinking that as I'm playing, oh, and then I kind of make a mental note of like, oh yeah, I should, I should pop in and make that change and then save that patch. And there are other people yeah. that just want to reach down and twist live, you know, and they're they're going to crank something up and make it really loud and, and explosive in the moment. Um, and I'm, I'm not totally that way. I kind of want to have it set and ready to roll. Uh, but that's just sort of the music that I play. Oh, got it. You okay. know? I get it. So, like, yeah, so one of the reasons why people might want to have single pedals is if so they can alter stuff actually on the fly with yeah. the playing in. Yeah. yeah. Because, again, just to just to um, say it just one more time, most most people, most bass yeah. players are still using single effects. Even, yeah. like, if you think about LeFave, single effects pedals. Yes. Jonathan Marin, who we both love. Not yeah. We also love Tim LeFave, but, you of know, course. we're, you know, yes. bro broskies with both of them. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, single pedals for Jonathan as well. Right. Um, somebody else that you might not have heard of um, actually, who's in the multi effects camp is yeah. Chris Hargreaves. Oh, so, do you know who know Chris, Chris Hargreaves is? No. He's a really fantastic bass player. He plays for a band called the Submotion Orchestra in, okay. in the UK, but he's also plays with like Dizzy Rascal and like a bunch oh, of like massive Dizzy artists. Rascal. Yeah, he, you know, Benny Greb, the drummer? Of course, yes. Right. So, Benny Greb, so like when um, he had his trio, I think that Kit Downs, who is the he was a key he played key bass in Benny Greb's trio. Then Kit Downs left. Then Yannick Guizdala did okay. a bunch of stuff with him. Then y Yannick Guizdala and then Chris Hargreaves started doing the um, Benny Greb's trio. He's actually a multi effects guy, so he was ah. running like two M fives at some point. He was like using Line Six stuff last time I spoke yep. to Chris. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so he's in that camp. So it's. It's one of those things, isn't it, where it definitely some people seem to be really married to the single effects. Yes. And then some people like yourselves, Chris Hargreaves, are totally comfortable with um with the with the multi effects. Talking to Chris, like part of it was financial for him as well. He was like, mm. dude, like it just costs like thousands of pounds to get yeah. all of the single pedals. And he said, right. I can get this one box. It costs me like five hundred bucks or whatever it is. And it's all in the box. Right. Like, do you think that's a part of it as well? Oh, for sure. I definitely do. And, and and when you're kind of curious about things where you're like, I maybe want to use a flanger for this tune. And I don't know that I want to spend, you know, $150 to get a dedicated flanger and then get cables to route it into your board. And right, like it's a way to sort of taste things and go, ooh, I mean, you know, it, it can cause option anxiety, right? You're like, because well, now I have everything. It's like Netflix, you know, you just spend time cycling through the sounds <laughs> going, wow, that's neat, <laughs> you know? So you do have to yeah, have an yeah, idea yeah. of what you want. But if you're like, wow, I wonder, I wonder, I'd love to use a big, huge reverb on a thing, but I don't really know. I don't want to go buy a big Strymon reverb pedal. It's a great way to taste things and have um, and have a bunch of things at your fingertips without having to pull the trigger on all those individual boxes. And I want to say too, Scott, to your second question, I live in both worlds. So on my little board, um, I have uh, that, you know, HX stomp, but I also have other single pedals because I feel that there are some, single pedals as well. Go. Yeah, absolutely. So I think there are a few things for me that I just don't think the multi effects does as well, or there are things that are really important. So for instance, I plug into a big origin compressor and I love it. And the compressors in the HX are fine, but I'm so used to the big compressor. I change it all the time. I like to see the big analog meter. It just gives me comfort. <laughs> now, 
Could yeah, I yeah. make a patch that sounds pretty close? I definitely could. But I like it. I like the functionality. Again, I like grabbing the knobs in the studio and going, oh, this needs a, you know, I need more sustain on this on this part, so I'm going to crank the compressor up. And so that I have as a single pedal. I also have the octave pedal that Spencer Doran makes for Three Leaf, which uh, he made in conjunction with Tim Lefebvre called, the, I think it's just called the octave. Um, and yeah. it's wonderful. It's wonderful. I'm used to it. I love the sound. The octave sound in the HX doesn't do it for me. It's fine, but whenever I use it, uh, I miss that particular box, right? And then I have a fuzz, mm -hmm. like a low gain fuzz that I use a ton called a Doom 2 that Spencer from Three Leaf also makes. And it's amazing, and there's nothing close to it in the HX. So those three things, I have a comp, um, uh, an octave, and then kind of this low gain fuzz situation that those things, if I have covered in external pedals, then everything else that the Line 6 does is perfect for me. Then I'm, I'm, I'm fine with its choruses, its delays, its, you know, anything that I, else that I may want to use, as long as I kind of have those uh, individual things covered first. So I'm kind of in both camps. Got it. Mm. Yeah. Do you use, are you using the distortions within the HX Stomp as well? Yeah, I, there's a, there is a yeah. drive uh, called Tima that's modeled after the Timmy drive that you can blend into a parallel path. And so then you have some clean bass running. So you've got a little low end and you have some grit on the top. And it's incredible. I actually prefer it to a bunch of standalone, uh, you know, drives that I've used. I use it all the time, um, you know, and part of it is just that I'm used to it. But part of it is that uh, I really love the functionality and I feel like I can get in and there's a saturation for the low end. So if you saturate all of the low end, it almost sounds like a fuzz or like a real dirty Led Zeppelin-y rock and roll-y thing. But then if you unsaturate the bottom end, it gets tighter and sounds maybe more sort of like modern metal. It's so versatile. Uh, so yeah, I love I love that sound. There's also a fuzz called the Clawthorn inside the HX that is just incredibly flexible and big and nasty. Uh, so I've I've found some things that I love and that I work with all the time that are inside of that thing, yeah. So would it be fair to say then that it's not like a there's not a huge sonic difference between standalone pedals and a multi-effects, but there's there's just different sounds, as in like you can get a bunch of great sounds out of a multi-effects, but you might not be able to get all of the sounds and therefore you might want to call on single pedals as well yeah and if you just what what happened to me is i just got used to some things i got used to the way a certain compressor worked and sounded i got used to the way a certain octave pedal sounded now if i would have got that multi-effects thing first i may have found something in there and then i wouldn't have bothered mm -hmm. right it's just sort of about it it really is about self-awareness and what you like and what you get used to and how you want to work but intrinsically yeah it's not like oh the multi-effects sounds are so much better or are so much worse you can't think about it like that it's just that they're different the octave pedal is based on the ebs for instance the octave sound inside of the hx it's based on the EBS octave, which is great, but it's just very clean. It's a very like clean, uh, warm, big sound. Whereas the octave that I'm used to using is more sort of synthy. It's grittier, it's square wavier. It sounds more like maybe the bottom end of a Moog or something. And that's just a, a, a sound that I gravitate toward. But if you came up on the EBS, um, that that sound you might love that octave sound inside the hx right so it's just about how and if you're right now if you're listening going i have no allegiance to any kind of octave sound <laughs> just just get one get a standalone or get the multi you know and and you yeah. start using it and uh and making art with it uh it it really doesn't matter until you start to develop taste around those things Mm. And what about, because there's an added, I guess that there's, it would be doing a disservice to the multi-effects thing. Side note, I just thought of somebody else that only uses multi-effects as well, mm. Gary Willis. Shout out to oh, the man Oh, I didn't, I didn't um, know that. 
Oh yeah, he's a big multi effects guy. Mm. Generally, sort of like Roland stuff. He's got okay. like he's, he's done all of the. Do you know the sort of like the pickup on the? Oh bass, sure, the black yeah. Roland pickup. Yeah, sure. The sort of like so he can make his guitar sound like a saxophone and all kinds of stuff. But yeah, that's a whole different level. What I was going to say, is, <laughs> yeah, isn't it? I know. Yeah. But the um, what I was going to say is that the multi effects also do a bunch of things like amp simulators as well, don't they? Yeah, and some yes, of they them do. even they can be like an interface, an audio interface. Like That's where right. does that come into play in terms of like the amp simulators and the, in, like, are you using amp simulators live? Like what, what's going on? Right. <laughs> I will say, I will say this. I am overwhelmed by the amp simulator stuff. So when people talk about pedal overwhelm um, or like, oh man, like, like Jacob Umansky, for instance, who is, has done some stuff with SBL, incredible player. He uses the neural DSP, I think it's called the quad core mm -hmm. and that unit yeah. it, it is i can't imagine getting into that ecosystem because not only are there all the effects but then there are all of these amps and sims and you can change the tubes in the amps and you can change the mic you know if the mic is off access one inch away 1.5 inches two inches 2.5 right yeah. and so that and and the line six stuff has some of that flexibility i mean it has you know there's mic distance and all that but that is the stuff that i feel like i get too into the weeds and i'm out so i only ever use the amp sim stuff if i'm recording something that needs a real sonic footprint i never use the amp sim stuff live ever um, because i feel like all of this stuff kind of happens to the low end where there's either some kind of like weird low mid bumps that happen or some, you know, when you use the SVT, the real, real uh, subby low end kind of gets rolled off because you're running into this cabinet simulator. And I just am like, ah, I want a flat. I, I like the sound of a DI. I want to know that my bass is just like, it's more about like my yeah, comfort yeah. zone. Um, but that said, I have like, when I've gone into the studio, there's like a rock project that I, recorded with and I have a T-Bird. And so I got the T-Bird, pulled up an SVT, kind of found some sounds that I'm like, oh yeah, this feels like a rock and roll, modern rock thing. Um, and I like that music too. And so I'm kind of drawing on, ah, okay, what are some stuff I've been hearing on like modern rock radio? How am I gonna kind of saturate the bass? And then it's, it's wonderful, but I think it has to be goal oriented. And, and like when I did the Tim Comerford uh, Rage Top 10 for SBL, I listened to him really specifically. And then I found, I built an amp sound that you, you know, if anyone is listening to this and is excited about that, that's all. All those settings are in the PDF workbook, actually, in that YouTube video, the, the Rage video that I did. Uh... But I just found, like, I was like, okay, I know he uses an SVT and I know he uses, you know, the, this kind of cabinet setup. So I just sort of tried to do it and then use my ears to kind of like, well, let's see if I push the mid range. Does this sound like Tim? Maybe not, you know. And then Stingray, you know, bright strings. Well, let's see. And then I kind yeah. of found this amp combo and a dr drive and amp combo that sounded like Tim. But the deal is I was going, I had a very clear goal in mind. I was recreating Tim Comerford's sound, right? Dude, and so then confessional confession, yeah, dude. When yeah. I listened to when I listened to that video, I mm -hmm. did wonder whether you'd done that. Because I listened to it and I was like, it's so close. I actually I actually meant to message you and say, dude, did you use amp simulators <laughs> and stuff to get yeah. that sound? Because it's so ridiculously close. Did you do the same <gasps> thing for the Jackson's happy. video you did? Yes. Did you do the same uh, thing for the Jackson's video? I did. I used that. I tried to get kind of like a clean, wide, open sounding B15. Um, Dude, and so, so close. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, so I, that close. stuff is my heart. Like, that stuff is truly my heart. And the one, I think the one that I'm most proud of is the Getty one. I did moving pictures for SBL, and I really, really spent a lot of time trying to get close to that. But, but I'm not, uh, I'm not like, using that stuff all of the time for the things that I do. I'm, I use the cabinets and all that stuff when I'm trying to create something that is a very targeted goal. Just like I wonder, like, are you always using certain jazz vocabulary or are you only using that jazz vocabulary when you have a certain musical target in mind, right? Like you're probably yeah. not playing minor, or like uh, melodic minor licks over an R&B tune, unless there's a specific fill that you want to push outside of the box. It's a tool, right? Yeah. 
And yeah. to me, the the cab amp stuff is very similar. It's like to achieve a desired effect. I would never use that stuff all the time and have it on all the time. It's like Michael League has a great quote about effects where he says, I only want to use an effect if it would be musically irresponsible not to do so. <laughs> like, you know, here comes a break in a snarky tune and it needs to go boom, 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 psh, boom, 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 psh. At that point, if he has clean, bright electric bass, it would be musically irresponsible. He wants to step on the pedal to make the vibe happen, right? And Oh, he's so good. <laughs> he's so good, dude. <laughs> oh, and if anyone listening, um, if you've never checked out, Reverb did a, um, a pedal kind of overview with Mike League where he talks about how he uses pedals. And he's a standalone guy. He uses just, you know, all individual pedals. But it's what's interesting is not the pedals, it's not the models, it's not even the sounds he makes, it's why he makes them. It's why he thinks that, oh, sw like swinging with clean, with clean envelope sounds like Bootsy. Or it's, you know, all these things that he talks about uh, with effects. He has real clear references in mind. And that's the, you know, mm. that's the thing that you have to have is like, why do you want to make a sound? I get, I get DM'd all the time. People say, oh, what should I get? <laughs> and I say, what do you like? <laughs> you know, like, oh, what how should Ian, I build a pedal board? What should people get? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just what you like. Uh, you know, I mean, there's, of course, there's best practices. I mean, and, and we've been talking about doing like a pedal board course for SBL. That's something that I would yeah. love to do, actually, is say like, hey, if you want to start out and get a few things, here are a few things to get. Obviously, there's a tuner, right? Some kind of drive, um, some kind of drive that you like the sound of. And that is that could be just that's like a lifelong. But um, one that I love very much is the Way Huge Pork and Pickle, which has a fuzz and an overdrive option. And it sounds fabulous. That's a great box for drive and fuzz. I've got one. I've got one. Hang on. Do you? Oh, it's it's fantastic. That's a great pedal. But if anybody can ching, yeah, <laughs> it looks like this. Yeah, that's such a great pedal, and it can really, it can do a thing where you can just have a tiny bit of hair on it and have it always be on, and it kind of sounds a little bit like a yeah. driven amp. Or you can crank up the drive and it can sound very like end twistly, a tacky overdrive. Or you can click it into fuzz and throw it through an octave pedal and now it sort of sounds synthy. So it's very, um, that pedal is excellent in terms of versatility. It's small, it's pretty inexpensive. I think a drive and an octave pedal and a tuner. The octave pedal is so interesting because you have to change the way you look at playing the bass. You kind of play up high, you play everything an octave higher, and it really just puts you into synth bass territory. And and in modern music, there's so much of that. And I feel like whenever I turn that on and play above the 12th fret on any of my strings, people go, oh. You know, and it, it finds its home in so many things. I mean, it, it's beautiful yeah. in with a singer-songwriter playing long notes behind an acoustic guitar. It's beautiful in, a, in an avant-garde jazz context. It's beautiful in a pop gig yeah. thing where you're playing staccato, punchy. And it. what I love about an octave pedal is it takes you out. You can't play the normal stuff you play down low and make it sound good. Um, there's actually, probably by the time this is published, there will be a... Um, I did a video uh, for SBL called "Why Does My Octave Pedal Sound Like Shit?" <laughs> and it's it's oh, like yeah, yeah, best yeah, practices. Yeah. yeah, it's around best practices of how to get the best out of that out of that type of box. But you have to change your playing and yourself to kind of accommodate that sound. But it's so good for you, you know, because it it forces you outside of your comfort zone a little bit. And then when you kick that on. I find that um, I'm kind of now thinking a little more like a synth bass, a key bass player might. And so, and, and then that can combine really nicely with the fuzz or the overdrive if it want, if you want it to be a little more aggressive or gritty. And then, you know, you got to mute with your tuner. Those would be the three things <laughs> that I would buy first. Dude, have, 
Have you ever had this, right? You're on a gig. I mean, I mean, you must have had this. But have yeah. you ever found a fix, like a, a mental fix for this? Mm. You're on a gig. It's it's the tune with the octave on, or there's a part yeah. of the tune that has the octave on. You bosh the octave on. You're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it just feels so massive. And so it's just good, like a, yeah. You, your trousers are flapping. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, and then and then the unfortunate bit comes, oh. and you have to switch it back off, and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> and now your bass just sounds like an apologetic kind of like, hmm. oh, I'm I sorry, hate that. guys. <laughs> okay, yeah. well, like, yeah, 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 of course. I mean, I had that. I, I was fortunate to work with a front of house guy um, named Cody Anderson who worked with Prince and uh, and he I remember in the beginning for me with pedals and with you know and, and even just like buying preamps and stuff I had the Sadowski preamp do you remember that black kind oh, yeah, of square yeah. Black that they book, yeah yeah and it had a di in it and I remember the bass boost on that thing was centered around 40 Hertz and oh boy turning that sucker up. Oh, I would crank that thing up and I'd send this big bassy signal to front of house. And I remember I did some gigs with this front of house guy who said to me, you're, you're sending me a crazy amount of low end. And all I'm doing is I'm just um, high passing you. I'm cutting it out. Uh -huh. He's like, w he's like, why are you doing that? He's like, I have subs on aux so I, I can put as much low end into the PA myself and if you're sending me all this crazy low end i can't put you in the pa so then i high pass your sound and it, it's awful he's like so would you try to just turn that off for me and i was like oh <laughs> sure <laughs> right and and then yeah. he's like and then you're using these synth bass effects where you're kicking on an octave pedal on top of the 6 db boost you're sending me of low end he's like it's it's not responsible and he's like, so let's let's work together to find um, some happy mediums. And I really learned a lot. What's also playing, work out for us? yeah. And I I learned too. I played in some I've played in some big churches, some big rooms in Minneapolis that are uh, churches. And those front of house guys are unbelievable. They're in that room all the time, weekend to weekend. They're super good at what they do. And so I would have guys saying like, there's an amazing um, guy in Minneapolis named Trent who would say to me, um, hey man, when you kick that patch on, eh, it, it, it's 2 dB too hot. So um, let, let's work on that. Bring it down. And and in, you know, in the next run through, drop it a little for me. Or else what happens is if you kick on the octave pedal, it's way too hot. It slams my compressor. I turn you down. It jacks up the mix. Oh, so I started to get really aware of when I would turn on a pedal, it wasn't blowing up the room and it's so interesting because there are guys more in like a like a avant jazz space where like lefebvre yannick talk about these things of like oh man yeah you put on the dod meat box and you blow up pas and they talk about that like a positive thing and i have never experienced <laughs> yeah. that uh, like that that to me would get me fired like that's actually i think that's like a really irresponsible thing to do <laughs> <laughs> but Trent, but I'm not Trent, your your mate Trent is not gonna like that. <laughs> Trent Trent would be like get get this Joker out of here. I mean, really, he'd be like, what? Yeah, yeah. like that would never fly on a pop gig. I mean, if you you know if you're working with Kelly Clarkson or you like <laughs> that stuff, that ethos of like turn on this thing and it's gonna destroy. That might work at the Baked <laughs> Potato or the Fifty Five, but that's not gonna work at the XL Energy Center. So. It's yeah, it's yeah. just about knowing where you are and what you're doing. And I'm not saying that blasting, I mean, maybe being in a bar with a small PA and a huge low end thing happens, it might be really exciting and wow, that's cool. But the situations that I'm working in, I try to send levels that are all within, you know, two or three mm. dB of one another, whether it's a big distorted fuzz sound or just a clean bass sound. Because yeah, I don't, I mean, it's a long answer to your question, but I don't want that feeling of now when That's I great. turn off the octave, it's a bummer. So it's just about yeah, yeah. play, play, turn it on. Wow, is there a huge volume jump? You could maybe even see it in your DAW if you're recording or something. Okay, turn it down. Mm -hmm. Notice where that is. When you turn it on, you maybe want a touch of boost, just a little, but you don't want it then to when you turn it off to be like, oh, I love that. I love that thought. I'm like, <laughs> it's sad. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> oh, I used to play geez. this. It was uh, like a it was a reggae band. I used to play in a reggae band, but we did sort of like it was reggae but mixed with um, it was like it sounds bonkers, but like reggae mixed with like grime and and I yeah, had so oh, many. Awesome. Like, I, I had sort of like a Moog pedal with the sort oh. of like expression pedal, and it was just oh, running yeah. like so many pedals. But there was like a couple of tunes where it was just sort of like mm. normal bass. <laughs> <laughs> Felt so apologetic when I was when I put that I was like hey eh, eh. <laughs> hey fellas yeah, uh, I've just yeah. run in my normal bass signal now so uh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, good day I good feel time. that well but but I mean so yeah you know, I've I've talked a lot here I mean about the things that I do and and like and I would I would be so curious to know too like your pedal journey how you feel about standalone versus multi effects and I mean I had no idea that you played in a reggae grime band that's incredible I mean mm, yeah like, <laughs> what have what have been your experiences because I know too that you've told us that like ah you know you're you're never thinking about pedals or sounds first you're thinking more maybe about lines um technique yeah uh you're you're thinking um notes and and like your approach to crafting a line before maybe you're thinking about sounds and I'm just curious like where where do you feel like you're at kind of in that journey at this point okay like at the very beginning basically i feel like mm. i'm at the very beginning just to be yeah just to be open and transparent i feel that i have so i'm just gonna do a massive cough <clears throat> I feel yes that yeah i have been so focused in the past on um i guess sort of like experimenting with harmonic sounds on the instrument that i was and what i was like for the most part the kind of music that i was playing it what i what didn't really have the opportunity to, to experiment with effects um so i just really feel that i'm at the beginning of that journey so yeah i really have only got i think i'm like 10 percent in in terms of level of geekdom that i that i want to reach i'm 10 percent in and 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 for me it's always been single pedals but i'm very since i've been watching you um play and what you've been doing with sounds i'm really interested in getting into the multi-effects thing and just yeah. you know kind of just getting into that world um and what else have i got to say on it and just i guess just learning or learning how to and we've spoken about this on a previous podcast about developing my philosophy of sound like yeah developing good... that side of it because yeah we've spoken about this before and we've said that obviously you know there's technique and there's the scales that you use and the harmony that you use and the lines that you play and all of that but and that is a skill set in on its own to to master yes. right but then so is sound like sound is a thing that you need to hopefully try to and it's an ever ever expanding thing that you're trying to mastic so obviously you will never get there but my, sure. i guess my point is that in terms of discovering my tonal philosophy and what i'm searching i'm 10 percent in so i'm just so under indexed within that area right now that i feel like a newbie i'm like i, I know in terms of like what amps i love and how to plug into an amp and get a great sound i've yeah. got that nailed I feel yes. really confident on that. But in terms of like the sonic side of experimenting with effects and bringing that into what I do, I'm just a bit, I'm just, I'm just starting out. I'm just like, and what I use, just if anybody's wondering, is I'll use obviously like a tuner or a clip on tuner or whatever, but I'll use like a distortion. I will use an octave. I love chorus and re i mean i love uh reverb and delay like reverb and yes. delay are my two th like i love that i just yes. like, love putting on like and that those shimmer reverbs and oh like i could just yeah. play with reverbs all day to be honest so all of the strime and stuff is very attractive to me so i spend cool. countless hours listening to people play in sort of like ambient vibes with oh strime wow and yeah 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 but just like what you were saying earlier is that 
I would love to find a multi effects that gave me the ability to play with all of those things without having to go and buy Strymon pedals and, and do that yeah, whole thing. I yeah, kind of want to yeah. find something to experiment within um, that, you know, so I'm not geeking out on brand new pedals all the time and spending sure. money on a gazillion yeah. pedals because yeah. I think that it would be a dark, a dark rabbit hole of doom <laughs> that I might go down. Oh, it so is. for me, yeah. I'm definitely interested in multi effects right now because of again watching you but also that i want to uh, explore i guess my son like sonic creativity on the instrument and and learn more about it and develop more as a, as a musician in that space so for me looking at multi effects like what options are there for somebody like me who wants to expand into effects obviously there's the single pedals and yes. and, and that's endless you could yep. there's so many single pedals and amazing manufacturers out there i get so excited Crazy. about all of the pedal manufacturers it's like there's something just let me put it out there i think there's something very similar between from like skateboard culture and yeah. boutique pedal culture there's some yes. weird crossover i don't know what it is but it's, it's there right but what do we do the multi-effects thing like like obviously there's the line six stuff i just yeah. saw there's a brand new zoom thing that came out last week a zoom yeah b5 b6 maybe or whatever it is yeah. what do i do what do i do what do i do ian i mean hmm, i'm just trying to figure out the best way to advise you before i before i try to answer that for you or say like oh here are all the options that i know about the the one thing that i want to tell you that i hear you saying is you really do need to lean into that ambient thing because when you talk about like, oh, I could just play for a re like every, anybody listening, do, do you do you remember just a minute ago how excited Scott got when he said, oh, I could just play with reverb for hours. That is hours. the take. Hours. Not so that means you like that sound. <laughs> it means that that is the thing that you need to pursue. That's it. You know what? When you said that, you know what it made me think? Damn. I want to I want to play with reverb for hours too and I haven't ever really thought that <laughs> but because of your passion <laughs> like it made me think like man maybe I should play with reverb you know like so that's the stuff that's really sticky right is like you get so excited mm. about that right so finding something for you whether whether that is a Strymon or I, I hear you saying you want you want like maybe a multi effects thing so you're not spending all this money on on individual things but finding some long reverb tails and like really just digging in and then you know um setting it up and where where you can play that stuff and then turn it off and then play other lines while the tail is still mm. hanging over and then turn exactly it on to play a thing that. up high and yeah. yeah um so i think i think for you what, what i would recommend <laughs> is the thing that i use uh, it's, it's the line six stuff <laughs> uh Primarily for for two reasons, they've just updated uh, all of the reverb settings in there, so they're they're going after the people that like the the flint, the big sky. Oh, what's the other big Strymon verb? Um, but but they're going after people that like those sounds and want those in a maybe a multi effect situation. And then there's the switching in it is so amazing. So you can, for instance, you could assign one of your foot switches to be momentary, meaning that when you step on it, it turns on the reverb. And then when you lift your foot off, it turns it off. So maybe you're playing bass and then you wanna go up high and play a passage with reverb and you step on it, you play the passage, then you lift your foot off and the trails continue over the thing that you play. It's just so, um, flexible the things that you can do or of course you can just turn on a reverb and play but the way then that you can integrate that into your setup live is is amazing one, one other just a quick uh pitch for the <laughs> line six and i'm not affiliated i just need everyone to know like <laughs> line six has never approached me I, I feel like i have helped them sell a lot of pedals and they have never if anybody, you know, is, <laughs> if anybody from line six is what listening to this get your shit together <laughs> get your shit together oh, and give man. ian a shout yeah Jesus. yeah like uh there's a, a a miley cyrus tune you remember that song party in the usa scott do you know that song yeah, yeah by miley yeah, cyrus yeah, yeah. yeah. The bass line does this amazing octave jump. Wow, wow. And you know, you can set up a switch on the HX to be momentary. So when you step on it, it triggers an octave up rise. And then you release it and it comes back down. 
So you can use just the stomp switches like a whammy pedal. You can use them to do anything. Wow. And that's really fun. It takes a little bit of programming, but not a ton. Um, and so yeah. that's, that's what I know, so that's what I recommend. Um, but that said, there are other platforms out there. Um, and, there and there's yeah. various there's various Line 6 things, though, right? So there's the yeah. head check. Like, what is available of the Line 6 stuff? What is that? Oh, I mean, there are sort of like more prosumer things, I think, of like like the pod go where and they're marketed more to guitar players where it's like you kind of have everything in one thing and there's even a foot pedal that can be a wah or a volume those things have never really appealed to me um because i kind of use the hx stomp which is the smallest one that they make the smallest multi-effects that they make i use that integrated mm -hmm. into other pedals as i've said before but like if you fall in love with that platform you can buy a helix and what that is is a big floorboard that has the pedal on it you can route four channels so you can send dirty left and right stereo and then a sub channel down the middle and i mean if if <laughs> programming you know and there are people those seem to find their home like in metal projects, like people that are really into playing uh, heavy, heavy sounds are kind of maybe in that zone. And like Billy Sheehan uses a Helix now, I think exclusively oh, is, is in that. And maybe that's not true, but I know that he has and they've modeled some things after his old Pierce preamp. And, um, yeah. And then even within the HX stuff, there are a few things. There's a thing called the HX Effects that is a bigger one that has more display options, but it only has the effects and not the amps inside. It's interesting. I mean, I have a friend who has one of those yeah, yeah, because he doesn't yeah. care at all about the amp models, but he wants more switching flexibility. Um, so, boy, it is, it's deep. <laughs> They, they just made another thing called the Stomp XL, which is, you know, um, wider but shorter. And it kind of uh, it has more uh, flexibility for switching. And, and it also has all of the amps and uh, effect sounds in it. But it's a little bigger, right? So if you have a big pedal board mm. or, you know, maybe that would be great. I think it's, uh, geez, I mean, it, it's so hard for me to say like, oh, yeah, here's what you should get. Because it just mm -hmm. sort of depends yeah. on on what you need. Uh, but if someone was like, okay, just if if you could recommend one multi effects thing, what would it be? I think the HX Stomp is probably the best product that Line Six has ever made up to this point. It's small. It's the most powerful thing I've ever used. Um, the tuner in it's great. All the sounds in it are great. Uh, it even has an impedance. Like when you plug into it, it senses the impedance of your instrument and provides you the most open sort of like cable sound. It's amazing. It, it's amazing. <laughs> that feature alone is worth money to me. I mean, and, and no one ever talks about that stuff. So um, I think that product is the best product they've ever made. Um, and, I, and I love it very yeah. much. I think I could probably just do anything I could probably make all of my sounds just in that and get rid of all my other standalone things and kind of like, well, the octave is close and the compressors are close. But, Got you know, it. those yeah, yeah, those yeah, things yeah, I, yeah. I do like. Um, but, yeah, I think I don't know anything about Zoom. I don't really know anything about the Boss multi-effects. I've never spent any time with Fractal with Axe Effects. I've never spent any time with Neural DSP, but a lot of people love that. You know, it just kind of yeah, depends on yeah, how, yeah. like, what you like the vibe of. <laughs> I mean, you know, like the artists that are representing yeah. those companies, and you know, do you do you resonate with any of that stuff? Um, but it's hard to say, like, oh yeah, this thing is going to solve all the problems for every player. It's 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 very hard to prescribe something like that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that like an interesting thing that we probably won't be able to answer as well, because if you haven't had experience with all of those multi effects is I wonder if some of them are just easier to use than others. That's more accessible. Like I can remember Chris Hargreaves that I was speaking about. I can remember him thinking, I think it was the M5 that he used, mm -hmm. which was the, the old Line 6 thing. Mm -hmm. And I can remember him saying, they're really great because it's kind of just like single pedals. But yeah. it works. Yep. He said, so yep. it, it's, it's really like, and I'm, I might be butchering it, but it was something like that. He said, it's really simple. It's just single pedals, but just in a multi-effects box. Yeah, yeah. And he really resonated with that. So is that what the HX Stomp's like, or is... 
He there's a li- what the HX there, dom's like. It, it is, but, but it's sort of like a logical progression. Uh, it, it's a little more computery than the M stuff. If anyone has ever had an experience with that M5, M9, M13, it was kind of like okay, that started as like all of those colored stomp boxes from the early 2000s, the purple one, the green one, those are now all in one thing. And they were all color coded. Oh, wow, well, I'm on the green stomp. And so that means I'm using delays. And now the HX stuff has all of those sounds. But if you don't like the look of a green stomp, you can change it to pink. (laughs) Or you can, you know, you know, like there's just, there's more flexibility. But that said, boy, those M, the M5, M9, the M13 was really big and kind of unwieldy to me. But the M5 was just one, you could only use one sound at a time, but it had a bunch of sounds. That's cool. The M9, you could use, I think, three sounds at a time. Wow, that's that's cool. That's a little more simple. And now with the HX, why you can use eight sounds at a time. Okay, but you only have certain foot switches. And so it becomes a little more convoluted, but the architecture of how it's built is still the same. There's just more options. So again, for me, it was this logical progression from I used all the colored boxes, then I used the, the M stuff. And then because I'd used those things, the HX stomp was like, oh, there's a little more programming, but but it's not bad. I, I oh I see I, I see how yeah, I have to yeah, push these yeah. two buttons to access this thing. I mean you know if if you're not adverse to to learning a, a bit of a learning curve around a pedal, it, it's wonderful. But if you are that, that that's okay, then you can stay with individual pedals or or buy like even an old M9. I mean they're great, they're great. So it it's just about how you like to work. And, and I would love to, Scott, to talk about like um, even this thing, the question that we're asking in this podcast, do I have to build a pedal board? I'd love to know if you've ever yeah, built you a, a board. So we've been talking about pedals a lot, right? Like the individual versus the multi. But what about actually putting them all together on a on a thing <laughs> on either a oh, either yeah, a really dude. expensive I, I, thing or or a thing that you bought from the wood shop and painted black or a cutting board or a <laughs> you know like i've got like a massive board down there like a huge yeah. it was a massive thing like this so yeah yeah it's maybe i'm looking at it now it's maybe like two and a half feet long i think it was like a gator made it or something like that. yeah so sure yep yep two and a half and it's when i was playing in that band and i had to have the board because i just had so many pedals on it and of course. it would just be yes unruly brute to turn up to a gig and have to like plug all that stuff in and it was so complex we were running like we were splitting the signal so i was just i had two i had one pedal that was just sending sub so i was just sending sub straight Amazing. to the desk and then yes. and then another signal went into all of the other pedals and yes. like it was a whole yeah. thing. So that's so the reason why i had to have that pedal board is just because it would have been lunacy not to. I couldn't yeah. have turned up with a ba- and all of that in a bag because <laughs> I would have just been like, oh, what's going in where and which? It was just so oh, cool. Yeah. So that's, yes. that's the time that I got my shit together and had to have a board. But other than that, I haven't in general had a pedal board, which I, f- sure. I do feel guilty about. Don't um, feel guilty. Don't feel guilty. Just, yeah. I feel a little guilty <laughs> turning up with my, my bag of nuts, nuts and bolts. Yeah. But um, yeah, like, what, what do you think? Do people have to build a pedal board? Is there a benefit to building a, a pedal board other than the other than being able to turn up and because obviously you want to be as pro if you're doing gigs and stuff, you you want to be you want to come across as pro, right? Yeah. And you don't yep. really want to be the guy with sort of like eight pedals all swimming around on stage and yep. you forget to put a patch in and it's like, oh, no, okay. something's broken. And then yes, it's not yes, really yes. broken. So there's obviously there's that side to it, right? Yes. So f- from sort of like a pro, being a pro kind of angle, you do kind of want a pedal board. So if we're talking about Hurley, like Sean Hurley, of course he's got a pedal board. John yeah. Bunn, of course he's got a pedal board. Sure, you, sure. Of course you have a pedal board because you sure. turn up to the studio, you bring your pedal board out, everything, all of the work's done beforehand and you yes. are not a numpty trying to plug all of this <laughs> together in front of the engineer and the artist and they're like, oh shit, we made a mistake. We should have hired the other guy. <laughs> Hold on. 
numpty <laughs> please this is a brand new word to me <laughs> let's have a little oh, yeah, yeah scott and ian british slang i feel like i need to like push a thing and like like whenever there's a, a word you say i need i want a sound bite that's like hold on let's uncover that british slang word like there needs to be a <laughs> <laughs> jingle numpty do you know yeah. a friend of mine the other day he was like he was like oh this dude was such a tree pig i was like tree pig? what's a tree pig he was like who knows, dude, but it sounds good. I was like, I'm going to use that tree pig. Tree pig, and it's great. Yeah, I have an idea of what a numpty is. Yeah, it's an idiot, right? Yeah, yeah. and a numpty yeah. is just an idiot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. An, an idiot. I mean, you know, um, yeah, so so you hit it right right away. Like, you, if you ever have played live... Or you're, or you're on a session, you don't want to be the person that's taking too long to get all your crap off the stage or on the stage. You don't want to have that stress of plugging in individual pedals, things get bumped, the power cord comes out, and now your whole signal. Like, I'm amazed that live music ever happens. There are so many little tiny cables. I mean, have you thought about that? You know, the, like, power cable in your amp that's just held in with tension? <laughs> you know, like, oh, yeah. the IEC yeah. that goes into the back of your amp to power your amp is it's just held in by tension. And I mean, just wiggle, 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 the show's over. <laughs> you know, it's like, bonkers, isn't it? I actually bonkers. heard, I can't remember what band it was. There was a band, and I knew the, the front of house guy, the engineer. Oh, man, I, it was like a big band. Anyway, yeah. so, and you might have heard of stuff like this before. The entire show was to, cl to, was to click, right? So the entire show was to click. Yeah. And they actually ran, they'd recorded the show live, and they ran sort of like a B version of the show sure. as they were performing. So if anything went down, like with the vocal mic or whatever, they could they had a B version running at the same time. They could just right. click that on. Nobody's going to know anything. All the it's good. amazing. <laughs> so, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, there are a lot it's of amazing, pop groups that do that, that run like, especially if you're running tracks, running like a redundant rig so that if the tracks go yeah. down that have all the BVs and have all the, you know, all the keys in it or whatever, it just immediately <laughs> switches to this other computer yeah i mean yeah. yes so i think i think a pedal board is a great way to mitigate disaster you know it's a great way to have all your stuff organized so that all you need to do is plug in power plug in input plug in output you're good to go um I had a funny thing. I grew up in a band, in this rock band, and so I made this giant pedal board, you know, probably like you, Scott, where, like, I had this big thing that was all band-oriented, right? It was, like, for my band, and that's awesome. Like, in your 20s, you know, you should have an aircraft carrier pedal board. That's amazing, you know, because it, it helps you learn. But then what happened yeah. is that band, you know, we weren't doing as much anymore, but that was still my pedal board. And I started to work as a session musician, and I, I'll never forget getting hired by this great, like, deep cut kind of R&B band in Minneapolis, turned up to the Dakota, which is a great jazz club in Minneapolis, and pulled out this giant stupid pedal board, which I thought was amazing. <laughs> but everybody on this gig, dude, there's a killing <laughs> guitar player in this band named Blair Krivenick. And Blair, if you, if you ever hear this, man, I'm so sorry that I was that guy because Blair is the dude, high strapped up telly cable amplifier you know like amplifier <laughs> up kind of loud yeah, and then he's just using yeah. his volume knob and his tone knob and when he takes a solo he just pushes his volume pedal all the way up and and just concept nails it yeah just yeah. crushes and i'm the asshole with the aircraft carrier pedal board <laughs> that is you know so i had this real <laughs> this real like oh i can't be that guy i was embarrassed yeah. you know and then i'm and then i'm yeah. saying things like oh don't worry guys i'm not going to use any of these pedals on the gig but this is the pedal board that i have that has my di and tuner you know and they're like well all right man <laughs> but here let me I, I let me just do this because i think i think it would be cool um do my do I, it i know that if you're if you're not watching the podcast uh this this is going to be useless to you but but for those of you that are watching let me just show you this pedal board so over time over time, I have consolidated everything I use into this board. And it's really small, but it's all the things that I love. Oh, yeah. So I have this big compressor here. So I really only have, what, five? There's five pedals is all that are on here. And one of them is a DI, and it makes no, you know, it's not like um, making 
sounds, right? It's so really I only have four pedals that contribute any kind of like tone shaping capability, really. I have a compressor. That compressor then goes down into that octave pedal, which is the white box in the bottom corner. That goes over to that yeah. Doom, which is that fuzz. That goes over to that HX Stomp, which is the audio Swiss Army knife that I love very much. I, and I even think that description is doing it a bit of a disservice. It's really a lovely sounding pedal. And then up into the Noble DI, which is just a wonderful platform. Um, and, and that's it. That's all I have. And so I find that... That's all you've got, yeah. Yeah, and sometimes I'll plug in other pedals maybe before or into the, you know, you can interface other pedals into the HX Stomp. Like, so if you want to run a different envelope filter or whatever, and sometimes I'll do that. But I find that this, these five things on this very small little board are the things that I use for probably 98% of what I do. And then it's just all ready to go. It's not too big. I can, I can walk into any session and no one's like, oh, geez, here's, you know, big pedal board guy. Or I can play any gig. I can fly <laughs> with it, you know. Um, and, it's, and then when I, uh, when I come home from a gig, I pop it on top of my studio desk. So it lives right next to so my arm's reach. I'm not using my feet when I'm at home. I'm, you know, yeah, adjusting the, yeah. you know, knobs with my fingers. And it's right at kind of table height. And it's amazing. This, any, if anyone wants to know, I record everything that I do for artists through this board. Everything that I do for SBL runs through this board somehow. I mean, I'm not using all the sounds all the time, but you know, the Noble yeah. DI is always in play. The compressor is typically in play, um, and and I just love it. And it's the benefit to doing something like this and and really being choosy and building something where you're like, yep, here's the. Limiting the size is really, I think, important and saying, here's the size. So yeah. what can I get that's going to fit into this? Really forcing you into some kind of constraints and making choices. And then it's always set up. You're never tearing it down, right? And maybe you're swapping you something mounted? out. Okay, so what this is mounted? a board. Yeah. yeah, this is a board by a company now defunct, which is so sad, called Salvage Audio. But it's but it's this beautiful wood box and then it has input and output in it too. So, you know, the DI plugs into here on the side and then, um, yeah, see there's power and, and a oh, power God, switch yeah. on the side. And so input and output are on the side. So I actually never plug into a pedal because inside of this pedal board, everything is routed into connectors. So, you know, when I plug into the pedal board, I plug into the side of literally the side of the board. And so then mm. jacks are never coming in and out of pedals. Nothing is ever going to come unplugged. You know, you're not wearing out the inputs of your pedals by constantly, you know, unplugging and plugging and throwing them in a, in a bag. It's pretty, I mean, you know, knock on wood, but it's, it's been very consistent in that regard. Got like it, when yeah. I show up. And you always run, you run through everything as well. So it's going through all of the pedals all at the same time. Cause I know there's some, some guys actually, they've got like a direct signal and then they bring things into that signal. If that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. You'll run maybe kind of a switcher that I, I think if I had more stuff again, the compressor is always on. And then there are just three pedals that all have really nice bypass. So I'm, I'm never feeling like, Oh no, there's, you know, tone suck or something. But if I were running yeah. 20 different pedals by, you know, boss and full tone and, you know, it, all different brands and different styles of things, then I'd be like, oh, I should probably get these into some kind of, you know, like true bypass switcher. But I just don't, for, for this size of board, I don't think that's necessary. You can't hear any sort of like, de sort of like you know, like loss of tone or whatever if you do that, yeah. No, I, well, I mean, with these pedals in particular, I just think it, they make it better, honestly. Like the, the buffer inside of this compressor is incredible. Even when, you, even when the comp isn't on, I like the sound of the bass into this first regardless <laughs> like yeah, I, yeah you know even if i'm not using the comp i think the buffer in here and the transformer it's like plugging into a really really nice studio preamp and so then mm. that signal feeds everything else and it's just it's gravy um so yeah that's that's my little simple setup and you know i talk about it if anyone else you know wants more info on that i talk about it a little bit on insta and and i'd love to do you know we're talking about doing some kind of like effects course maybe uh with sbl too so you know hopefully that'll be coming yeah. in the future yeah 
Oh, dude, we need to do that. We need to do that. I'm racking my brains uh, if I've, we've missed any questions that I should be asking you. And, I'm, and I say asking you because you are the the effects efficient. Do you know what I mean? The effects dude. Um, yeah. Um, I, like, Should I have asked you, is there anything that jumps to mind that I should have asked? Sure. That people will be like, no, you missed off this absolutely, you know, must have question. Um, I, I do get asked a lot about signal chain, like what order to do things like, you know, so people will say like, oh, I, I bought all these things and oh my God, how do I hook them up? Right. Um, and I think that's a pretty simple, for me, it's pretty simple. Um, I, if, if you have a compressor, I think that goes first, provides a really nice, strong, even signal to other pedals. Some people disagree. Some people put it as a as a mitigator at the end of a chain so if you kick on something really wily and insane the compressor kind of keeps it closed down but it, but again i really try to get my levels set so that's never happening so i compress first then you go into anything that's kind of uh, pitch shifting so an octave pedal or if you have any kind of you know whammy pedal anything that's a pitch shifter it needs to see a clean signal yeah. in order to shift correctly so Com compressor octave then i go into any gain stage if i have a drive or a fuzz that always comes directly after octave and then i would go if uh a multi-effects if you have a multi-effects i think that's at the end um but if you don't have a multi-effects after the after the gain stage i like to go into any kind of maybe envelope filter if there's anything that you're using that's kind of funky or envelope filtery that's great and then at the end of everything uh, I think modulation and reverb and delays, all that stuff comes at the end be because you want the delay to be, uh, you want like the fuzz to be feeding the delay. So the delay has the you fuzz want to catch sound everything, in it. Yeah. Yes. But yeah. again, it just, it, it really does depend on what you're going after. But I think that is a really good first place to start. Compression, if you're using it. And again, you don't have to use any of these things. Compression into pitch shifting like an octave into gain devices overdrive and fuzz into envelope then into um modulation like chorus uh delay flange and then maybe reverb at the end and then i run into a di that sends all of those all of those terrible choices that i've made to or hopefully not hopefully good choices <laughs> i've made to to yeah. the recording desk or you know um yeah, that that's typically what I do. And you mentioned something really interesting as well just earlier. You said that you've got your compressor on all the time. I now do. I know that you, yeah, you have um, done like a bunch of stuff in the past that's been amazing to watch. Where you're actually um, demonstrating how you can use your compressor in many different ways, even like yeah. just as like a, a sustainer and just having that note sustain and, and yeah. do that, you know, be. Like use it almost like a, a separate effect, right? But sure. in terms of like standard, bog standard everyday bass playing, yeah. why do you like break it down for people that might be thinking like, what? Why? Why does he have compression all the time? Like, yeah, like, yeah, I it's have compression on all the time. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Okay. I I got really into compressors when I was recording. I uh, did a bunch of recording, and there was an, a great bass player in Minneapolis named Aaron Fabrini, who is a genius. And he he had purchased all these amazing big studio compressors, and he just said something to me once where he was like, "Man, have you ever played through a great compressor? It's just intoxicating." And I'm like, "Why?" He's like, "Because it brings all of the nuance of what you're doing." Doing to the top and I thought wow that's interesting so what I do um, it, it really does it really does show uh, the either the good things or the bad things about your playing so if your technique isn't clean or your muting isn't clean a compressor is sort of like ooh, it sort of like highlights that stuff but if it's clean mm. ooh, it brings up all this nuance here's here's how I use a compressor always it's always a blend of a compressed signal and a dry signal. I never use just a compressed signal, almost never. So if I get a compressor, what I do is I first I turn off all the dry and I just try to get kind of a big squashed, contained, fat sounding, compressed sound first. But then the problem is, ooh, it's, it's really compressed and it's really, but it feels like I have no dynamic headroom. Well, that's a bummer. And then you blend in the dry. So then what I, what I think about is depending on the situation, if I want more dynamic and headroom, bam, 
bang, I want to pop out. I want to play a solo that, that steps out. I favor the dry. But if I'm playing a pop thing with an octave pedal or something, and I want it to just be this big, just boat that's the tugboat in the harbor you know i favor the yeah, yeah. i favor the comp side so it's just so i set up a real squashed side and then the clean unaffected side and then depending on the thing i'm blending those two things to taste but and you will will you adjust that on the fly between songs and stuff no never i i kind of just like i have an idea of like for this project probably like w for instance Go when ahead. i play i play in a cover band and when i'm playing live i just want a little bit more um uh, uh horsepower in dynamic i want to be able to play really light and have it translate as light and i want to be able to step out and have it translate that way so i favor my dry signal more but i still have the comp side in there a bit as well um, but if I'm in the studio and I'm playing effect sounds, which I do a lot, I favor the comp side hard, and then I pull the dry side back a little bit. Um, but again, that's just me. I, there, there are some people that, like when, man, I was out in New York and hanging out with John Davis. He has that big, amazing, beautiful synth pedal board, no compressor anywhere. And, and I, I couldn't believe yeah. it. I was like, man, maybe I'm doing this all wrong. <laughs> you know, it, it, so it's, I think, it's just... Yeah, it's different yeah. philosophies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Different philosophies, isn't it? I can remember th talking to... I, no, I wasn't. I was reading an article, and I can't remember what monster bass player it was, but it was like a... Like, you know, one of these monsters, and and they were just like, I never use compression. Compression right. is for people that 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 can't that haven't got the dynamics under control. Yes, yes. You know I mean, yes. don't have like all of this stuff. And and honestly, like I understand it's sort of like it is a philosophy. it's one it's a philosophy. And he that's what he holds close to his heart. Yes. For me, you know, I don't think that obviously if you go in any studio and work with any engineer, they're gonna stick compression on on yes. your tone, you know, so yes. on on your tone, but on your signal. So I, I don't think it is as cut as dry cut and dry as you either you cannot have compression or you must have compression. I think it it depends on what philosophy you have and what what you know what you what you're looking for. Well, then I wonder too if that was John Patitucci because I just watched a, a thing of um, his course where he says something about my goal when I started to be a side musician in New York, I think, was to never be compressed. And I thought, you know what my immediate first thought was? Mm -hmm. I hope I get to spend time in a room with you and let me set up a compressor for you, John Patitucci. <laughs> <laughs> that was my it, it immediate thought. It wasn't John. Yeah. It wasn't <laughs> yeah. John Patitucci. But okay. interestingly, yeah. John Davis was John Patitucci's student. So oh, yes, I wonder that's if right, that's, that's right. You yeah, know, I wonder if that's be. sort of like, yeah, right. kind of sort of filtered down, yeah, maybe. Right, because what I love, I, I never use it as a, some people have this idea about compression as it's a problem solver, as it, oh, oh, if they need to pull out compression, uh-oh, that means you don't have your shit together. I don't think of it that way. Mm. I think of it as a tone enhancer. For me, I play pretty light mm. and pretty, try to play pretty consistently. Um, and I'm not smacking the bass a lot very often in what I do. So for me, a soft note with, with a compressor that is sort of like pushing up the nuance, the texture of the note, the sustain of the note, oh my God, then you can just play soft and you have this huge sound. And then if you want a little God, more yeah. horsepower in the, in the, uh, in your dynamic range, you just push up the dry. So for me, like, I would love to be like, John Patitucci, John, if you ever listen to this, let me see <laughs> if I can bring compression into your life and not make it a bad <laughs> word. Because, because Mr. Patitucci, yes. right now, it's a bad word. It's baggage for you. I would love the opportunity, John, to make it a good word. <laughs> Dude, next year, next year when we're all in New York, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Uh, Thomas, yeah, yeah. Bring your compressor. You'll turn it with yeah. your like, Just Right, like, right, I'm, Mr. Hey, buddy. Come on, come on. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think that that's a common thing, you know, of people that have been like in a studio situation and someone is clamped down. I mean, there's, compression can be done really poorly, right? If you clamp a compressor and then every note that you play, you have zero dynamic range and you're going god this is awful if that is your experience of compression take my hand i'm going to guide you to a different <laughs> a different land <laughs> where the compression oh, is man, we need to do some stuff on this you need to do some videos on it as well man. you really do you really do i think it's yeah, so interesting yeah. and i think that it's 
it can be uh, it can be really misunderstood. And I definitely have been misunderstood by it in the past. You know, like sure. I read those articles and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then for me, the the way that I found compression was just completely yeah. by accident. I was sure. on a gig. Um, I was playing over in Malaysia. Um, in a theater in a in the pit right so i'm in this pit and it was like this this old old school trace elliott and um and it had like a compression on it you know built i was like oh well you know, compression no yeah I, yeah yeah you know oh d- dude i was Give like, it a in go. Pit for like six weeks yeah i was yeah. in this pit for six weeks playing the same stuff i need something <laughs> to experiment with yes, so it's yes. like i'm gonna kick on this compressor see what it's like and you know what i actually preferred it just the that it just gave me like gave the tone an overall just like some kind of like just more fatness it yeah. just sort of like sat fatter in the mix and i was like yeah. oh i like mm-hmm. it so i did mm-hmm. more of that gig with that i did when i as soon as i switched that compressor on i actually kept on for the entire gig so and yeah. ever since then I'm, I'm looking i've got like the cali 76 over there that i use all the time um yeah so i'm i'm into it man I'm yeah into it. man yeah it's a cool it can be a really cool thing if especially too if you have that big fat sitting sound and then if you're going just gosh i i just don't have dynamic range anymore then you just turn up the dry and then man life is good i think that's a nice it's a nice combo yeah but I get All asked about that a lot. All the compression pedal guys need to be, yeah, like loving on us this week. And especially <laughs> Line 6. Again, before we wrap up this episode, just want to say, if anybody from Line 6 is listening to this, please, 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 please <laughs> message Mr. Allison and give him some free pedals or something. Because he's probably sold hundreds for you. <laughs> uh, anyway, I mean, dude. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, go on, Ian, go on, Ian. I don't want to cut you off. Oh, I, no, that's fine. I was just going to say, for me, what it is, is it's 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 less about like, oh, I want free stuff from anybody. It's I would love an opportunity to say, if you did this and this and this to your product, um, it would it would increase Ooh, the yeah. usability of it. It would make people want to get rid of their some of their standalone things. I would love the opportunity to speak into Line 6's architecture around a couple of sounds. That's always how I feel of like, oh, I would love to talk to someone to, to say like, from my perspective, if you did these changes, it would be game changing for the bass community. And these manufacturers aren't always making changes for the bass community, but if there was a little bit of consideration there in the octave sound and a couple of the fuzz sounds, um, it would it would change. It would be a game changer. There would be bass players that, that would that, ditch yeah. a bunch of things and just use that one product, yeah. Well, that's interesting because the HX Stomp isn't actually a bass pedal, is it? It's sort of like just a multi-effects unit for many different instruments, right? That's Mainly right. guitar that's and right. bass, obviously, Mainly but guitar. you can use it that's for right. other stuff. Yeah. yeah. And what's interesting is Zoom have released this, I think it's the Zoom B6 or something like that, or B8 or whatever it is. Yeah. It's not even in the shops yet anyway. And that is specifically for bass players. So maybe in the future, Line 6 will do something for bass players. Could It'll be. be interesting looking at the fe- the feature set of the Zoom and what they've specifically done for bass players that might not have existed for guitar players i'm assuming that they will have some kind of you know the the boss oc stuff in there like what would you just to wrap up what would you change or what would make the hx stomp perfect for bass players what's missing right now if they were to take a look at the flavors of the moment and and make sure to always include some kind of recreation, like everyone talks about the Noble DI, they and the Noble DI is amazing. They need to model the Noble DI and have that as a preset. And even if it didn't sound as good, or I mean, you know, or if it wasn't the same, of course it wouldn't be the same, they need to give that nod. That's the that's the way that they are going to signal that they're going that they're listening to the community. The fact that they don't have a noble preset, the fact that they don't have an OC2 preset is insanity. Um, and yeah. the fact that they they need to up their game a bit on the compressor side too. If they did a noble, a compressor revamp, and an OC, it would be people would, well, at least for me, for me, that would be a big, big, big game changer. And I'm sure other people too have some thoughts around, oh, you need to do this and that. But, and there are a couple other little technical things where like in the tuner, you can easily just change the like 440 or if you bump your toe, uh oh, now it's 443. 
and you're tuning to 443 oh. hertz, and that means that you're... <laughs> I mean, that should be a deep menu option, line six. That's a deep menu option. That's not, That should not be on the tuner. That should be deep in. You want to tune to 432? Cool. But let's not be able to bump that with our toe in the tuner mode, you know? Um, so, you know, it, it's it's that stuff. It's just, it, it's pretty simple things, but I feel like uh, if, if they're a little six, more... Cons- yeah. using people gigs around the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, uh, but it's, you know, if, if anyone ever uses any product, right, and extensively they have feedback and line six is pretty good about taking some feedback but those are some surprising things to me that i think wow if they fix those things there would be uh a lot more people would be happy about it especially in the bass community bring it on yeah that's yeah that's really interesting actually because the thing just i think that what you said there about and nodding to uh, certain product types will be their way of signaling or could be a way of signaling to the community that they are plugged in and listening right exactly the thing when i was yeah the thing when i was watching the zoom ad that carlos oh carlos you brute you're an amazing bass player um carlos um he's done this this um this ad for the new zoom thing and and on the thing the presets they're flicking through the presets the boss things in there right and it does it says like boss oc whatever mm. and for me i was it that's the signal to me i'm like oh these guys are actually they give a shit they you know they put the stuff in the box that needs to be in the box yes. for bass players in this community so i think yes. that really matters and let can i just say one more thing i know we're i know we're wrapping up here but the the thing that i think is the most important aspect of this whole conversation is you need to use the the sounds and the things that you like to use that you gravitate towards. So for instance, Scott, if you bought that zoom pedal and you found some stuff inside of it and you were like, dude, look, listen to this sound inside the zoom, you know, immediately I would want that zoom because of you, not because of the zoom, but it would be because you, right? Your creativity brought the best out of the pedal. And that's what people are always responding to. Like when I make a sound, it's, I I would like to think that people are responding to my creativity versus, oh, that just that specific sound in the pedal. That's how I respond. I see John Davis from Nerve make all these amazing sounds or Tim and I go, wow. And then I want to buy those pedals, but I know better. It's not really about the pedal. It's about they're going to find that sound in anything that they use, probably. They're going to hunt that stuff down. And that's the thing to really pay attention to. What sounds do you want to make? If you're listening to this and you feel overwhelmed or you're like, oh my God, I I know it seems to be cool to put together a pedal board, but I don't even know where to start. Listen to music. And if the bass is making a sound that is somehow different than just a straight up dry electric bass, wonder about that. Is it overdrive? Wow. Well, then if it is and you love it, there are so many flavors. And if you, SB, faithful SBL podcast listener, find an amazing overdrive and do something amazing with it, guess what? Scott and I are going to be like, what the freak? What pedal is that? We want that, right? Yeah. It's about how you use it. And then people start to ask you questions about what it is. It's not, but it's, Typically, what it is matters less than the thrust of like why you wanted to use it, what you listened to to make you want to make the sound, right? It's like like you said, Scott, everyone can buy a Nord keyboard, but not every keyboard player sounds the same, right? Everyone can learn (laughs) a melodic minor scale, but not everybody sounds the same when they play melodic minor. It's the same thing for effects. So chase the things that you love, double down on it, and then we are going to ask you, Scott and I, that, you know, they'll be in five years, there'll be somebody that is making this crazy sound, and Scott and I will be like, what on earth is that? <laughs> you know, and that's how, that's how, you, that's how you become influential, yeah. is following that, following that bliss, following what you love, and, and doing it, and then people start to ask you about your thing or what you're using using um the the gear matters very little absolutely man dude i just want to acknowledge your effects awesomeness on this episode i have learned 
a huge amount. <laughs> Hopefully everybody else has dug it as well. Um, this was out and out gear, wasn't it? I liked it. I kind of liked it. Was out and out gear, last, man. We, we... On the last episode, <laughs> we were sort of like it was like a, a family confessional. We were hugging <laughs> and crying. This one it's is true. Like, okay, we've got, we've got to cleanse ourselves and get back into the gear. <laughs> Hey, you're going to get it all but on the dude, SBL podcast. You really are. You're going to get it absolutely. all. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Dudes, if you've enjoyed the episode, obviously tell your bass friends about it or just musician friends. If Well, maybe not. Maybe more bass, bass friends for this episode. But um, And go and leave us a review on iTunes if you're over there. If you listen to us on Spotify, I don't think you can leave us a review, but you know, keep tuning in anyway. <laughs> yes. And obviously, we will see you. We'll see you next week. Take it easy, dudes. Certainly so, will. Bye. Peace, everybody. Mm-hmm.